Okay, so we're going to carry on now with collective communications. Um, and to, I suppose to motivate this is the example you've just been doing in terms of this global sum, this global reduction, uh, with this message around a ring. Actually, when you're doing this with point-to-point -point communications, there's a, a little bit to think about. You know, you've got to write some boilerplate code. It's quite easy to um, have it deadlocked, potentially. And you're not necessarily guaranteeing that doing it in this way, implementing this sum with this round a ring approach, is the most effective, most performant way of doing it. So what MPI gives us is, in effect, these collective communication calls as a single call in MPI that the library developers have already implemented for us. So we don't need to reinvent the wheel. They've done all the hard thinking for us. But also, they've gone down, they've optimized it, and even below that, the hardware um, developers have optimized it to make it as performant as possible. And what you'll see in the practical after this is you'll be replacing the message around a ring with just one collective communication. That simplifies the whole thing from the programming point of view. Um, and in this sort of half hour, we're going to look at lots of different examples of collective communications. Now, a collective communication basically involves communication in a communicator. So all processes in a communicator communicate. And they all must post the communication call. That may maybe a bit more sense to you later on. Um, received buffers must be exactly the same size. So with point-to-point -point communications, the library implementation can sometimes hold your hand. So if you're looking to send a message into a received buffer that's not quite the right size, often it will do some error checking and, and give you an error. But with these collective communications, doing this buffer size checking on lots and lots of different processes can be more expensive. So often it doesn't um, do this checking for you. So you need to make sure from the programming perspective that's correct. We don't have any tags in collective communications. And this third point about all collective operations are blocking isn't quite true anymore. In terms of the latest version of the standard that you've got, which came out recently, they've actually introduced some non-blocking collectives. But these are beyond the scope of the course. So we're going to be looking at blocking collectives. And the semantics, the actual what these things do, is exactly the same for the non-blocking collectives, apart from the non-blocking collectives also give us a request handle back. Exactly the same as the point-to-point non-blocking, and we use the same functions on it to, um, to manage these non-blocking handles. But I say we're going to concentrate on the blocking collectives. So the first blocking collective to look at is barrier, barrier synchronization. And what happens here is when a process calls this, makes this call, it will wait at this point until every other process in that communicator has called barrier. So you can imagine you might have a load of different processes. One's here, a couple are up here, one's up here. If barrier is here, this calls it, these go down, call it. This one up here goes down, calls it. And then when they've all called it, they'll then continue from that point. Now, comment I would say on barrier is if you do need to use this in your code, stop and ask yourself why. Don't get me wrong, there's some occurrences, some exceptions to where barrier is quite useful. So for instance, you'll see in one of the exercises, if we're trying to marshal access to an external resource like a file, then a barrier can be quite useful to make sure processes are doing it one by one. Or if we're doing some timing, so you want to time how long it takes for all processes to get through some point of code, then a barrier can be quite useful for that. But if you're using a barrier in your code for the correctness, i.e. to make sure some communication is completed, data is um, consistent, then it's much more likely that you've misunderstood something and there's a bug somewhere. And the reason I say this is the number of scientific codes I've seen which are littered with barriers because whoever's developed this hasn't really understood what they're doing with the communication calls, hasn't really understood the modes of them. So it's put barriers in to make sure, and then somebody else takes the code, sees lots of barriers, and thinks, well, I better put these in myself. And before you know it, there's loads and loads of barriers, and the code's really inefficient.
and lots of potential for deadlock. So this is a barrier. If you're using it, ask yourself why and reevaluate would be my advice. The next collective um, communication is a broadcast. And this is where a single process, the root, will broadcast a value or values to every other process in the communicator. So the root in this buffer passes in its, uh, its data, number of elements count and of a certain type, and then it will broadcast these to every other process. So for instance, if we pass in a count of one data type of int, it will send this single element to every other process which finds it in the buffer. If count was two, the type of int sends two integers to every other process, the same integers to every other process. Now, a common error people make with this call is they assume that they only need to post the call on the root, on the sender, which is wrong. As I said before, with all these collectives, every process in the communicator needs to post a collective, every party involved. So even if you're not the root and you're going to receive some data from this broadcast, you still need to make this, this bcast call, if that makes sense, on that. The next collective to look at is a scatter. And I'll explain this through an example. So let's say here we've got process number one and it's got five elements of data. And what this scatter does is it scatters a single element to every process in the communicator. So we call scatter, it sends A to process zero, B to process one, C to two, et cetera, et cetera. You know, for instance, imagine your parallel code has read some data file or read some image that it wants to um, sharpen or do some processing on. It gets all this data and then wants to scatter it amongst the processes that can have their own little bit do some, to do some work upon. Now, the scatter call looks like this. And one thing I'd say about this is what tends to really confuse people are these counts in the scatter call. The counts are the sizes of the small messages. And what I mean by that is the send count is the number of elements the root will send to an individual process. And the receive count is the number of elements that a process is going to receive from the root. So if we go back to my example here, the send count and the receive count would both be one. Because the root process, here process one, is sending a single element to each process. And again, the receive count is one because each process is just receiving a single element of data. Now, this works contiguously. So if, imagine instead of 10 elements, we had, instead of five elements, we had 10 elements. If the count was two, what would happen is the first two elements would go to zero, second two to one, next two to three, next two to four, et cetera, et cetera. So it works contiguously. Does that make sense so far on this? If you had two elements, it would be two. Yeah. yeah. So it's the size of the small messages. Yeah. That's an excellent question. And the simple answer is, in most cases, it isn't going to be different. So yeah, in absolutely most cases, your send count and your receive count is going to be the same. The reason we have them as this difference is because the data type is different as well. And potentially this can give us some flexibility. So for instance, your send type might be int and you might be sending 10 ints. If our received type was byte, MPI byte, if we assume there's four bytes to an integer, then we might be receiving um, you know, that times four times a send. So if our send type was int, we might be sending one to each, so the send count would be one, sorry. And then if the receive type was byte, then it might be four, because actually each int takes, takes four bytes up, if that makes sense on that. 
So it's just for some flexibility changing this, this data type. But in most cases, the type will be the same on the sender and for the receive, and the count will be the same. The opposite to this that I think of is a gather. So a gather, in my example that I mentioned before, might be we've done lots of work in parallel, and then we want to get all the results, gather them back up, and write them into a new image, or write them into a new um, data file. So what we've got here is we've got a single element on each process, and we're gathering these up onto the root, so it's got these five elements. Um, and the same sort of comments. The count sizes are the sizes of the small messages with the gather. So any questions up to this point? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so the answer is yes, but not with this call. So if you look in your MPI standard, there's a V, so a scatter V and a gather V, and you can put in the number of counts for each process and the offsets as well. So it gives you a bit more flexibility, but you've got to provide it with a bit more information. So yeah. And that's useful if we've got uneven distribution of data. A good question. Any other questions so far? OK, moving on then. So thinking about the global sum, the reduction that most of you, I think, have got onto in the practicals, I mentioned at the start that you know, there can be quite a bit of, um, sort of overhead to you implementing this yourself. And the MPI library provides reduction calls for us. Now, I mean, very briefly, the idea of a reduction call is to take a value or values at each process, apply some reduction operation to them, and then produce the result of, of these values based upon that operation. Um, and MPI gives us a number of different operations. So what we've been looking at with this global sum is MPI sum. It also gives us MPI product to find the product, max, min to find the minimum and maximum, and some other ones, more advanced ones as well if we wanted to. Um, at the bottom, slightly more complicated examples. So for instance, sometimes, especially with the minimum and maximum, you don't just want the maximum or minimum value amongst your processes. You want to know what process this is on. And that's why there's a, a lock for location as well. And so these bottom two give us the value and also the index, the rank, that this was, this was found on. So these are the predefined reduction operations that we can use. And in the call to MPI reduce that does the reduction, these are specified here. So we have the send buffer, which each process says where its data is. The receive buffer, which is relevant on the root process, which will get the um, the result of this reduction, and then the number of elements and the type to perform the reduction on. And I'll come back to that in a moment. Now I'm going to show you an example of this. So let's say, for instance, we've got something like this. So process one is our root, and broadly speaking, we've got lots of different data on each process, something like this. Now if we do an MPI reduce, um, and our operator is O, so whichever operator, our count is 1. So what this does is it does A, operator E, operator I, operator M, and then puts the result of that into this buffer of root. Now if count was 2, it would do exactly the same, but then what it would also do is B, operator F, operator J, operator N, and put that into this second location. If count was three, it would do A and B, and also C, operator D, operator G, operator K, operator O, and put it into this third location, if that makes sense. So it supplies the reduction operator to the elements in a specific location 
count times. And in such a case, if you were going to issue four reductions, each of count one, so a reduction into there, another reduction into there, another reduction into there, etc. Or alternatively, one single reduction of count four, the data result would be identical. However, just doing one reduction over four elements tends to be much more efficient because the coordination and the communication can occur in bulk rather than lots of smaller um, messages and coordinations. Most commonly with reduction, we just want it with count one. But for instance, imagine, um, for those of you who are here on Monday morning, imagine we're doing some weather forecasting and we want to get the sum of rainfall and also snowfall and over the British Isles. Then we might do sum operator count two. In our first location is rainfall, our second location might be snow. Just to combine this, if that makes sense. Um, and this is an example of an integer global sum on what it actually provides to the call. So your data on each process, the result to write to, which is significant on the root, in this case the root zero, the number of elements, which are of type int, we're going to use the sum operator in the com world. Now, MPI provides us with lots of different operations for reduction, which is great. But the developers of MPI envisage the situation where you might want to do something with MPI that they haven't thought about. So what they also allow people to do is to develop their own operators for reduction. And this gets a little bit technical, so I'm not going to go into the ins and outs of it. But um, in C, you define a function um, and use function pointers. And in Fortran, you define a subroutine and um, mark this external. Um, and basically, what we're doing is providing an array of values in and in out, the length of these arrays, and also the type. And then in your actual program, your function code, you can do anything you like. So you can say what we're going to send in out is the value at i um, with the operator um, on the in array. Now, it's quite rare, I think, that you actually need to find a new operation per se. So you want to do something like a sum or a product that the developers of MPI haven't thought of. What's much more common, and something we're going to cover this afternoon, is if you come up with your own MPI data type. So for instance, if you have a data type for a matrix, and you want to do a common operation on this, like sum or product, and the existing operators built into MPI don't know how to interact with your own data type. So you need to provide your own operator, operator to do this, that decodes your own data type. So that's where this tends to be um, more common. Um, and if you are going to do this, you need to register your operator using the opcreate call, and it gives you um, a handle back that you then pass into these reduction or other calls that require an operator. The, I suppose, only other thing I'd mention on this is we provide a flag whether it's commutative or not. And basically what this means is if you say that it's not commutative, the MPI library will guarantee that it's going to process these values in ascending rank order. So from rank 0, rank 1, rank 2, rank 3, rank 4, in that order. That's going to be provided to your defined operator. If you say it is commutative, then MPI can give you these values in any order. So it might give you 1, 3, 2, 0. So potentially, if you say it is commutative, you might get a slight performance gain because MPI doesn't have to maintain this strict ordering. So that's what that's for. Now, there's a number of different variants of MPI reduce, which I think are probably more useful than the actual vanilla reduce itself. And the first one 
is an MPI or reduce. And basically what this is, is an MPI reduce without a root. So the value of this reduction gets written to every process in the communicator. So here, exactly like with the reduce, we do A, operator E, operator I, operator M, but then this value, as we've computed, gets written to every process. Certainly when I'm writing parallel code, um, it's quite rare that I need a reduction, but quite common that I need an all reduction. And what I mean by that is, yeah, if you're trying to compute something and want to write it to some file or display it on screen, then maybe you just want it on one process. But much more commonly, you want it in all processes because you're then going to use that value to determine whether you're going to terminate or for the basis of some further iteration um, calculations. So I would suggest that an all reduce is actually more commonly used than a reduce uh, itself. And the call itself looks very similar, it's just we've not got this root um, argument supplied to it. So the scan is a, a prefix reduction. So what a scan does is it does a reduction on the processes up until that point. So for instance, calling scan on process 0, it just puts A here. On process 1, it does A, operator E. On process 2, it does A, operator E, operator I. On process 3, it does A, operator E, operator I, operator M, and writes it in. So it just does the reduction based upon the data on the processes up until that process is rank. Um, and for an, for an example of this, you could do a, a partial sum on the processes up until your, your rank. And as I say, the, the arguments here are very, very similar to the reduce, and actually the same as the all reduce, it's just the semantics of the call which is different. So any questions on these collectives that I've covered? So certainly for the scope of this course, that's all the collectives we're going to look at. As I've already mentioned in answering to your question over there, there are some extra, um, more advanced versions of these. Um, and there's some also other collectives, which again are more advanced. But certainly the exercises that we're going to come on to um, just require the ones that we've looked up until now at.